God through the palms, through the shouts of Hosanna, through the joy, confusion, worry, and all the other stuff in our lives, we pray that you speak. Speak so that we can hear your word in these words, that we might be changed just enough not to be overcome by it all, but to be overwhelmed by your spirit and transformed in your grace. We trust that this is possible. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In your bulletin, because I gave the wrong scripture passage, it says Mark 1. We are not reading the baptism story of Jesus. We're in Mark 11. We are reading the entry into Jerusalem. I take full responsibility for that mistake. Uh, though it would be interesting to try to tie the baptism of Jesus on Palm Sunday, I'm not that gifted. Let us listen for what the Spirit may be speaking through these well-known words. When they were approaching Jerusalem at Bethpage and Bethany, near the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find tied there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, Why are you doing this? Just say this, The Lord needs it, and will send it back here immediately. They went away and found a colt tied near a door, outside in the street. As they were untying it, some of the bystanders said to them, What are you doing untying the colt? They told them what Jesus had said, and they allowed them to take it. And then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut in the fields. And then those who went ahead those who followed were shouting, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. And then Jesus entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he had looked around at everything, as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. This is the word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. It can almost feel a little strange to march around the sanctuary, waving palms, sort of singing, kind of uncomfortable, feeling a little awkward. Not really sure which direction we're supposed to go, but going anyway. In some ways, that is really what happened on that day. For those of us that are used to parades and such, we imagine a big crowd and everybody focused on Jesus entering. But the truth is, it's probably likely that few people, if any, ever noticed what was going on. This was a labyrinth street theater. And it had a particular purpose that I will talk about in a minute. So if you were feeling a little awkward, you were probably feeling like a crowd that day. You were in good company. But here's what I want to begin with this morning. I thought that it is possible that things could not get any more absurd in our culture, but this week, the world watched why two 70-year-old men tweeted about who could beat the hell out of one another. What's even more absurd about this is that those men, well, one of them is a sitting president, the other is a former vice president. Now, in case you haven't heard this, Joe Biden made a comment about saying that if he had gone to school with Donald Trump, he would have beat the hell out of him. Of course, the president could not leave well enough alone and basically said, Joe, better watch out. The truth is, it's quite a commentary on the ongoing reality of toxic masculinity. If you haven't heard that term before, basically it is one of the gender norms for men, the values of dominance over others. And that dominance becomes a sign of being a real successful man. Don't cry, 
don't show emotion. And any room you walk in, size up every other man to figure out where you are in the masculine pecking order. Some believe, and I am one of them though, that this is more than just about interpersonal relationships. It is at the heart of what is wrong with most, most of our public policy and our wars without but the truth is, toxic masculinity, though we call it that now, really isn't anything new. Dominance, power over others, coercion, violence is the human story. After all, by the end of the week, to God's love embodied in Jesus Christ, our response was to execute him in the most horrific way we possibly could imagine. Toxic masculinity in the cross. It's also a story that Rome knew well. They invented crucifixion. It's pretty gruesome. And they knew really well how to establish power over other people. When they would conquer a people, they would demand loyalty and high taxes. But they did something unique so far in the world of empires. Every culture could continue to practice their own religions. They could continue to live as they had, as long as they paid taxes, and they worshipped the gods of Rome. Just add that one to the many gods. The problem, though, was that in a place that practiced radical monotheism, the worship of one god, this presented a so high Roman taxation, plus the added humiliation of that demand, meant that the area that we know now as the Holy Land was always on the verge of violence. Oppressed people seeking to rise up. It's one of the reasons why each year at Passover, Rome would make sure to enter Jerusalem with a large military parade. And that military parade had one goal in mind. Establish dominance over the population. Create a population that would sit back. Maybe they would grumble and post things on Facebook. But they would never actually do anything which would challenge the toxic masculinity and dominance of Rome. All that from a simple military parade. This whole process, ironically, was called the peace of Rome. Peace through war, peace through violence, peace through domination, and threats of more war, and big military parades. But why did Rome choose this time? Why does Rome choose Passover? Well, the celebration of Passover was a remembrance how, of how God overcame another dominant empire the destruction of Egypt. It celebrated the destruction of the largest military the world had ever known. It celebrated the end of abusive labor practices. It celebrated the reparations paid by Egypt to the formerly enslaved Hebrews. And in this celebration, the hopes, the dreams, the revolutionary fervor every year was stoked in the people, and that was dangerous. Because these people had been pushed down, bent down, kicked around, and killed in their own backyards with impunity. But on Passover, on Passover they would feel their spines straightened and their resolves hardened as they asserted Hebrew lives matter. You can see that Rome had to make sure that this assertion was put back in its place. With heavy military correct presence, and a good public execution or more. And during this time, this Passover, this messiness, this toxic masculinity, it is true in our day. As we began this week that Christians in the West call holy, on this Palm Sunday, we wave palms and talk about parades and marches. marches. And yet, here's the interesting thing. In every one of the Gospels, most of the story has nothing to do with palms or processions or parades. Or even shouting Hosanna. That is a small part of the story that we have lifted up. The majority of the scripture of each one is actually spent in organizing. Organizing. And it means, then, that 
this parade, this palm worship, was way more than just a simple parade. The entire event was carefully planned. Notice what happened. Two disciples are sent with very specific instructions. Go get a colt. But there's not any colt. One colt that has never been written. You will find it tied and go get it. Bring it back. Oh, and by the way, when you go to get it, here's the password should anyone ask what you're up to. That's what Jesus was giving them. And yet the disciples run into this crowd of bystanders and they don't know who they are. But it's clear that they're working with Jesus. It appears somehow that secrecy in matters like today are necessary so as not to draw attention to what Jesus is up to until it's time to draw attention to it. A network and organizing. A carefully constructed and or orchestrated day even before it begins. Most of the text is on how they got the donkey and prepared and got the palms handed out. And when it begins, when it finally begins, it's clear that every step is carefully crafted. But it raises the question, to what and why? Why and what was Jesus up to? Well, we know that the writing on a colt that has never been written comes from the prophet Zechariah. That God's messenger will come humble on a donkey, proclaiming a new reign. It is clear that the prophet is fed up with human injustice, <coughs> and God will finally make things right. Humble to usher a new era. And if people are not sure who are watching this, who don't know about the donkey in uh, Zechariah, then they have the people surrounding Jesus on the front and the back proclaiming that he is the new king in the line of King David. It is a direct confrontation to the power of Rome. There can only be one king, and that king is Caesar. And here yet, this strange man on a borrowed donkey is being proclaimed king. Now, this scene comes directly from 1 Maccabees. That's not in our Bible. It's in the intertestamental period. And it's a scene where Simon Maccabeus enters Jerusalem to celebrate a military victory over the Hellenistic Empire. And they proclaim with palms and shouts of Hosanna. It's no accident how this day unfolds. The Palm Sunday that we celebrate today is all rooted in military imagery and prophetic judgment upon the way things are. A new king had come, but this king was different. Rooted in the prophetic tradition and riding down the Mount of Olives is a sign that this is about judgment upon the way things are. The injustice of the Temple State and Rome, where the poor are kicked to the curb and ignored, are no longer ignored in this prophecy. The new king, while riding humbly on a borrowed donkey, unlike Simon Maccabeus, does not come with an army. He comes with a ragtag group of country folk from the Galilean at the end of the day, this event, this Palm Sunday, was street theater. It was meant to shame the temple leadership and to poke fun at the mighty Roman Empire. They were having fun. Making fun of the ridiculousness, of the toxic masculinity that some military parade is going to prove something. Rome is what I was talking about. And it is a reminder with this small procession that Rome, just like every to an inglorious end. And those who watched the event on that day could not fully imagine what was happening until Jesus was on the cross, until Jesus was not in the tomb. Jesus going from this scene all the way to the cross is his refusal to perpetuate the continued toxic masculinity of eye for an eye. But until that happened, no one could fully grasp what was happening then and what is happening now. The 
Despite his followers choosing the way of violence throughout the ages, Jesus stood against the violence of empire. He stood for another way. Refusing to stand with the ways of empire, Jesus reveals the foolishness of toxic masculinity, which clearly continues to impact our life today. And therein lies the trouble with the palms. We stand on this day, or sit, and we wave the palms, and some of us sing Hosanna, what we're doing is making a stand for the peace of Jesus. We are standing with him, saying we will go with him. And we know full well that all the disciples abandoned him. But the truth is, there's really not any wiggle room, to put it simply, for the followers of Jesus to wave palms and wave sword. And that's what makes this day so difficult. As an Old Testament professor, actually a religion professor at Hendricks College and a former seminary classmate of mine, Robert Williamson, wrote about this text this week. He says, one cannot attend both the military parade down Pennsylvania Avenue and the humble procession of the King of Peace. One cannot worship both God and empire. One cannot follow both Jesus and empire. On Palm Sunday, we must make a choice. Sometimes when we've talked about Palm Sunday, I've talked about two parades on that day. The parade from the Roman military and the parade from Jesus. And you remember the military parade reminds you to stand in your place. You better be standing. Right? But don't do anything. But Jesus' parade says, yeah, come and join in and be part of it. The question is which parade we'll choose to be part of. And it is, friends, not an easy choice. Seldom are we given such a straightforward choice in the Gospels, but given the events of this day and our day, it is straightforward. We have to figure out where we will stand. There's no way to stand arm in arm with Jesus and embrace toxic masculinity. When I first heard of that ridiculous tweet fight, I wanted to take bets on Joe and realize that impulse was just feeding in to the same stuff that Jesus says no to. And though the decision, the choice is straightforward, it will not always be easy. We know that to be true. The struggle between following the ways of God and the empires of the world, well, it is just an every moment decision. And that's why we are confronted on this day, in some ways, with the palms. Whenever street theater is done in our own time, whenever people block highways in our own time, people get mad. I couldn't get into my basketball game in Sacramento. Maybe you saw that this week. But if it happens here, don't do it during rush hour. Don't inconvenience me. In some ways, Jesus was doing shy at the end of the week. It's a difficult choice. But once we pick up the palms, we can be convicted. So I put my doubt. No, I'm just kidding. It's a lifelong struggle. And it's important to remember that as we sing Hosanna and as we wave these palms, they have clear ethical implications for our lives as the followers of Jesus. So as your palm, take it with you, as it turns into hardened crust, and by the end of the week you'll be able to stab yourself with those, you've seen that? Let that not be a sign of our own hearts choosing the way of violence, because the week has gone on and we've gotten worn down, and frankly the next tweet storm has just gotten too much, that we want to join with the man who wants to punch somebody in the mouth. It's that story of Popeye. The idea of redemptive violence. The idea that at some point the bully's finally going to get what they want. What they deserve. And in the end, Jesus chooses the way of the cross. Instead of giving them what they deserve, he invites them once again to come and follow the way of life. And that's why the Pauls could be so dangerous. But life gets.